The book Achieving a Sustainable Competitive Advantage was published by Amazon.com in 2013. In the book, we describe and explain strategic alignment, which is both a business planning system and a business management system. So why should you be interested in strategic alignment? There are three reasons. <clears throat> First, companies who install and adhere to strategic alignment see immediate improvement in morale, decision-making, and financial results. <clears throat> Those who follow strategic alignment can achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. And strategic alignment will extend the life of a company. The first reason is rather self-explanatory, but we need to discuss reasons two and three a little bit more. A former chairman of IBM referred to sustainable competitive advantage in 2006 as the holy grail of strategic thinking. So what is a sustainable competitive advantage? Most companies are constrained as to how much they can charge for their products or services because of competitive pressures. But a few companies have given their customers a reason other than just price to buy from them. And these companies have attained a sustainable competitive advantage and consistently earn substantially higher margins than most of their competitors. Now, it's important for you to know that sustainable competitive advantage cannot be achieved just through an innovative product or service by itself. Those are too easily copied. You must have an innovative and unique business model to reach and sustain a competitive advantage. We will talk more about competitive advantage uh, in the rest of the presentation, but first I want to explain about extending the life of the company. As a matter of fact, this book was written because when I was in the telecom industry, I watched Western Union decline all the way to the bottom at that, at the same time, the demand for data transmission services, which from a technological standpoint is exactly what Western Union did, that demand was going through the roof. You wonder, how can something like this happen? So I looked around and I saw other companies, some in the telecom industry and others in other industries, suffer the same fate. Companies like TWA and Pan Am or DEC or RCA, and of course Western Union, and in fact AT&T. And this is when I learned about the life cycle of a business. Businesses start up, they go through a period of increasingly, uh, of rapid growth at an increasing rate month over month or quarter over quarter, and then that growth starts to slow down and they start to approach maturity. And they get to a point where maybe their growth is only as much as the economy is growing, the GDP, which is exactly what was happening at General Electric when Jack Welch took over and put in a new business model and totally brought the company back to the growth stage. Then, both sales and operating income start to go down. And when quarter over quarter, they have gone down for six consecutive quarters, the business is definitely in decline. And what you see is that the, the fall in revenue or sales and operating income starts to accelerate. 
And at that point, only one of two things can happen. The company can experience a rebirth, which is what Lou Gerstner did at IBM when it was losing eight billion, that's with a B, dollars a year, or the company declines to the point that it is acquired or it goes bankrupt. Trying to reverse the fortunes of a company that's in the maturity stage is difficult. Trying to do it when the company has entered the decline stage is very difficult. But in both of these stages, simply tweaking the, the strategy uh, and maybe introducing a few more products and it won't get the job done. So we have yet we have to watch what McDonald's does to see how they're going to pull themselves out because I believe that McDonald's has entered the decline stage. And in doing the research, I discovered that the average life of a company is only 40 to 50 years. I was surprised by that. As an example, if you look at the companies on the Fortune 500 list in 1970, 13 years later, by 1983, a third of them were gone. And of family-owned and operated companies, only 30% of them make it into the third generation. And yet some companies avoid maturity and decline apparently altogether. <clears throat> Some of the companies who avoid maturity and decline are Google, Amazon, Nordstrom, Apple, Starbucks, Costco, FedEx, UPS, GE, and Boeing. And uh, don't think that this is, these are just young companies. Uh, UPS was started 107 years ago in Seattle. Boeing's been around a long time. Nordstrom has been around a long time. And yet, the, how did they do it? They achieved a sustainable competitive advantage. And then they repeatedly or constantly remade themselves each time into a new and different company which restarts the growth stage. UPS has done it at least four times that I know of in its life. And some companies like Google and Starbucks are just constantly remaking themselves. Okay, for the rest of this presentation, we're going to focus on achieving a sustainable competitive advantage because with it comes endurance and avoiding maturity and decline. And I learned that companies who seem to endure and avoid maturity and decline they all follow most, if not all, of seven, seven guiding principles. Let's go over them quickly. Successful companies keep their central focus and top priority on the customer and his or her need. They identify and select their customers. They do not try to be all things to all people, <clears throat> but they select their customers and then they differentiate themselves on how they serve the recognized need of the selected and identified customer. And they develop and promulgate prioritized values, which become very important later in their life. Everything they do, <clears throat> all of their decisions, plans, procedures, actions and reactions, are in alignment with the mission. The leadership preaches the mission throughout the company 
with a religious-like zeal and commitment. And number seven, every employee, including the CEO, subordinates his or her needs to the needs of the company. So what can you do to ensure that you follow and adhere to the seven guiding principles? Well, what you can do is install and follow strategic alignment. The business planning and management system that we developed specifically to help companies achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. Our goal was to take what had previously been an art form practiced by a few, like Steve Jobs, and turn it into a science that anyone could follow. In fact, we developed strategic alignment. These are in blue here the seven directives of strategic alignment, and we're going to discuss each one of them. But strategic alignment begins with the customer need and ends with the customer reward. So the purpose of a company is to serve a recognized customer need. Now, this is going to be a need that exists outside of the mind of the founders of a given company. <clears throat> I can't overemphasize this because failure, failure to follow this is the number one cause of failure of funded startups that fail. 40% of the funded startups that fail, fail for this reason. And when they got to market, with their product or their service, there was no demand, or at least there was not enough demand to make it scalable. And that's because the need was in the mind of the founders and did not exist out there in the marketplace. <clears throat> Here's a couple of examples, a few examples. VisiCalc was the first spreadsheet. And it was created by a team led by Dan Bricklin, who saw a need. And it, it fulfilled a couple of needs. One, it, it took, it simplified and streamlined the process of developing budgets, which prior to spreadsheets was a laborious and error-ridden process. And it also gave engineers and companies an excuse to buy what at the time were called microcomputers. Because here, finally, was a, a real application that had a business usage. Um, it just so happens that VisiCalc was written for the Apple computer and it paid, played a part in the success and endurance of Apple. Computer output microfilm was not so lucky. In the 1970s, companies were trying to figure out how to keep the records that they needed to that were on their computers without buying more computer memory which at the time was very expensive. So certain companies started, develop, started to develop a way to print the output of a computer system onto microfilm, which it could then be um, warehoused. And while it was being developed, the cost of memory started dropping like a rock. And the trade magazines loved computer output microfilm, and Kodak loved computer output microfilm. But when it came to market, the customers did not like or want computer output microfilm. They simply bought a little bit more memory to keep what they had to keep, printed the rest on paper, and that's how they solved the problem. So computer output microfilm was a failure because the need did not exist. 
which is the truth also for Dow Jones online market report. Dow Jones had been looking for different ways to market all of the financial news that they got every day. So they developed a system and put in a nationwide private radio network and developed small boxes that would sit on an executive's desk. And this box, which was tuned in to this radio network, would be programmed with certain stocks, ticker tape names that that executive was interested in. And in the studio, before a new bulletin about a financial bulletin was read, the announcer would key in a code, and then he would read the bulletin. And if it was one of the ones that your box had been programmed to receive, the box would turn on, and you would hear the bulletin as it was read. You could also press a button and have it recorded and not come out live um, in case you were in a meeting. Dow Jones spent millions on the project and it failed miserably because again, there was no demand. There was no need. So we get to the first directive, which is purpose. The purpose is a one or two sentence statement of the purpose of the company. And it should be to serve a recognized need. More importantly, it is not the purpose of the company to make money. It is not the purpose of the company to pursue a technology or to beat the competition. The purpose of the company is and must be to fulfill the needs of the customer. The central focus and sense of urgency must always be on the customer and his or her need. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that financial strength is vital to a company if it is to survive, thrive, and grow. However, making a profit is a result of doing business. And it's a metric, and it's a measure of how well the company is performing. It is not the purpose of doing business. The purpose of the company is and must be to fulfill the needs of the customer. <clears throat> After that comes the mission statement. This is about a page and a half, single space. Statement of who the customer is what that customer expects from the company, what specifically the company will deliver to the customer, how the product or service will be delivered, and how your company will be different from the other companies who offer to serve that customer. In order for a company to truly differentiate itself, it must know and understand its customers on a continuous basis. Strategic alignment forces leadership and management to focus fiercely on the customer and that customer need. Every year in one of its issues, Business Week names the Business Week 50 which are that year's best corporate performers over the previous three years among publicly traded companies in several categories. And that year, what Business Week said was, what distinguishes many of these organizations is a deep understanding of customers, a competitive advantage that has enabled them to sell more goods and services than their rivals. After they get to know the customer and the customer need better and better, then leadership ensures that all the elements in the company are aligned with the mission, which is based on the customer need and serving that need in ways that provide a true, valuable difference 
to the customer. And then they continuously educate all employees, not just sales and customer service, but all employees in the company about the mission and the customer and the customer need and their part in meeting that customer need. In strategic alignment, the mission statement is the heart of strategic alignment and differentiation is the heart of the mission statement. Differentiation is vital. And the difference must have true value to the customer. In fact, the entire management philosophy and methodology of strategic alignment derives from one central tenant. And that tenant is if a company is to maximize its performance in a sustainable manner, it must truly differentiate itself from its competitors in the eyes of its customers. This differentiation must be real, visible, and understandable to the customer, and the difference must have real value to the customer. Because if you don't give the customer a reason other than price to buy from you, then he or she will make their buying decision based on price. And you don't want to be there. If your customer is buying from you because of price, you will never achieve a sustainable competitive advantage and you will not be able to avoid the maturity and decline stages of a company life cycle. The mission also defines and prioritizes the company's values and principles, which are very important in strategic alignment. The values must be well thought out and they must reflect the true view of the company's executive management towards the business and the company's constituencies, including the customer, the employees, the owners, and the community. After mission comes a vision, what future you will create for the customer. And it includes broadening of products, customer base, and geography. And these are the things that help you remake the company and keep it in the growth cycle. Wanting to do these things is easy, and knowing when to do them, however, is a trick. Here are a couple of examples of how companies handled the vision directive. Compact Computer was started by two engineers from Texas Instruments. And they invented and manufactured uh, the first portable computer. Uh, analysts wanted them to expand their product line, but they resisted and didn't do it until the customers started asking for more products, at which time they added desktop computers and then servers which the customers happily bought because they're the ones who asked for them. So Compact Computer handled the vision directive correctly. Sienna, on the other hand, is a technology company that invented and manufactured a device called a dense wavelength division multiplexer which was used by MCI WorldCom and Sprint to derive additional circuits over a single fiber optic cable. And Sienna did very well with that. But they failed to broaden uh, their customer base past those two customers. And when they were unable to get a contract from AT&T for the same product, their stock plunged from the high 80s to the teens 
and the company almost went out of business. After vision comes strategy, which is how you will fulfill the mission in the vision. And it's a detailed plan of how the company will make the mission and vision happen by defining who will do what, by when, and with what resources to realize the mission and the vision. And this is where a budget comes into it. And under strategic alignment, a company's budget is really just a statement of its strategy only in financial terms. Taken together, the mission, vision, and strategy constitute what we call the leadership directives and are the responsibility of the company's leadership. <clears throat> the leadership of a company are those people in the company that have the word chief in their title, like chief executive officer, chief marketing officer, and chief financial officer, just to name a few. <clears throat> but the leadership directives are primarily the responsibility of the CEO. After strategy comes structure, and it's, this is the skeleton of the company. And it contains, usually in writing, all the various things that the company needs to operate like their business plan, employee manuals, org charts, co compensation plans, quality programs, other policies and procedures. And you can see here that the structure and strategy and vision are all in alignment with the mission. After structure comes systems. These are the people, the processes, and the technology that support the mission and vision. This is where the rubber meets the road, and it's where most of the time, energy, and money of the company are invested. If you are a manufacturer, this is your manufacturing floor. And all of the processes and people responsible for bringing the parts and the assemblies to the manufacturing floor assembling them into products and then moving them into inventory. And not only does systems need to be vertically aligned with all of the directives above it, but the systems have to be horizontally aligned also, and they must be balanced. One common mistake that companies make is that they will invest in newer technology at the systems level but they won't invest in the educating the people and developing new processes to optimize the use of the technology. And what quite often happens is the technology is brought in and introduced and productivity was supposed to go up, but it in fact goes down. Because systems will be no better and no more effective than its weakest component. The seventh directive is performance, which is the output of the systems. And performance is the product or service that is delivered to, perceived by, and paid for by the customer. So the aligned company, the leadership directives, which we know are mission, vision, and strategy, create values and priorities that guide managers and employees in day-to-day -day decisions, allowing managers to remove obstacles between the mission and the employees so that the employees can meet or exceed the customer's expectations, such that the customer's highest expectations are realized and the company is rewarded with loyalty and high margins. Under strategic alignment, leadership and management have different responsibilities. It, the responsibility of the leadership to recognize and understand the customer need on a continuous basis and to get to know that customer and the customer need better and better. 
and as leadership is doing this, they also nurture the mission so that they can fulfill that customer need in a way that differentiates the company in the eyes of the customer and ensures that the strategy makes the mission happen. And leadership focused religiously on the mission and preaches it constantly to all employees. Whereas management is in charge of the structure and the systems and ensures that they are balanced among themselves and in alignment with the mission. And management also identifies and removes the obstacles that stand in the way of the employees fulfilling the mission and meeting the customer need as closely as possible. All of the directives align with and support the mission. Any activity that does not support the mission is eliminated. Everything begins and ends with the customer. Perfect alignment is not attainable. So the company is always either moving towards or away from alignment. Different companies are driven by different forces. Mission-based companies who align the elements of the organization are customer-driven. And these are the companies who continually rank at the top of their industry. In strategic alignment, we learn that markets don't exist, customers exist. Markets don't buy anything, customers do. Markets don't have needs, customers have needs. And those customer needs change in real time, sometimes suddenly. The leadership must know the customer and not the market. Markets are studied in the office and in conference rooms on paper and in PowerPoint presentations. Customers are studied in the field. So the leadership must get out of the office and out of the conference room and into the field and get to know the customer and that customer need and where that customer need is headed. And the leader must preach the mission throughout the company with a religious-like zeal and commitment. I have been to too many all-employee meetings where the leader talked about things like inventory turns and gross margin. Uh, things that most employees don't understand and the ones who do don't believe that they personally can affect those metrics. And I agree with them. Instead, leadership's job is to preach the customer, the mission, and the customer need to the employees, which are things that the individual employee does believe they can affect. Management's job is to eliminate the barriers to accomplishing the mission, implementing the strategies and providing the structure for the workers to responsibly accomplish the mission. The leaders must have a deep sense of who the company is, where it is going, and how it is going to get there. They must then constantly communicate this message to the troops at every opportunity. If leaders do this without let up, the company just might win. Principle number seven is that every employee, including the CEO, must subordinate his or her needs to the needs of the company. Without this subordination of needs by all employees, Differing agendas will arise and misalignment will inevitably follow. Strategic alignment offers four different metrics on the balance, what we call the balance scorecard. The first metric is the financials, which are the most lagging indicator. 
Financials will tell you that at some point in the past, you started moving either towards or away from alignment. Most companies also measure quality, but here we're not just talking about mean time between failure of products. We're talking about everything that every employee does that touches the customer. That is part of the quality program and it must be measured and followed. If quality is also a lagging indicator, but not as lagging as financials, if quality ind indexes are moving down, you're moving away from alignment. If they're moving up, you're moving towards alignment. Customer complaints are a current metric. And successful companies follow comp company, customer complaints very closely. And they uh, take action when customer complaints start to increase. The only leading indicator of how well you're doing versus your alignment is employee morale. If morale is going up, the company is headed towards better alignment. If morale is going down, morale uh, alignment is deteriorating. Aligned companies, in summary, are mission-based. They know what they are and what they want to become. They keep focused. They place the customer first. They trust their employees. They continually communicate with their employees. And when they're unsure, they are sure that the employees get it and they understand the mission and they understand who the customer is and that customer need and how the company fulfills that customer need, then and only then they empower their employees to serve the customer need. Companies who do these things outperform companies who don't. Thank you for your time. This slide gives my contact information I will enjoy hearing from you, especially any of you who think you might be interested in installing strategic alignment in your company and believe I may be able to help. I prefer emails. Again, thank you.